evening friends uh, welcome to this evening critical care um, classes from yasoda group of hospitals and icc hyderabad chapter we have been uh, doing this um, for the last 3 years or so uh, with lot of enthusiasm from the participants and our senior colleagues so today we have uh, one of the eminent faculty and a senior colleague who has been a seasoned speaker and a um a reviewer for most of the latest journals and a post podcast um, expert and has been um, putting a lot of blogs for all uh, the new controversies and the new papers so we welcome josh chako sir who is a senior consultant in narendra dalaya from bangalore and a faculty and teacher for all of us and uh, he has been a part of this all um, talks and topics so we requested him to talk on the controversies in the recent critical care areas and um, uh, he felt it's a huge area so he will take us through a few of those topics and from there uh, we will probably take one more part in the later so we welcome on board you sir and uh, it is a privilege and honor for us to have you on board thank you for joining us please sir um, it's uh, all to you up to you sir. thank you very much i will just start uh, my share screen are you able to see my screen can you hear me yes yeah, sir and we are able to see your picture sir is it on full screen mode yes yeah, sir yes yeah, sir okay thank you very much venkat for inviting me to this meeting so as you said we will go through some of the burning issues in critical care medicine during this session probably one of the many sessions that will follow in the future so the first controversy which is of a personal choice to me and that i feel has been a very contentious issue for many of us intensivists is regarding resuscitation in sepsis we all know that during the initial phase of resuscitation you give a lot of intravenous fluid as of course what we are expected to do all the evidence suggests that you fill them up make sure that you have enough preload on board and augment the cardiac output that is when you have the so called ebb phase of resuscitation when the tide is low when you need to increase perfusion to the organs maintain perfusion maintain oxygenation and as we know emmanuel rivers in his landmark trial showed that it's a very crucial phase which is the early phase of resuscitation in sepsis so during that phase you give them a lot of fluid and then during this period you might end up giving a lot of excess fluid to your patient for instance the vast trial which looked at vasopressin as a as a vasopressor in comparison to norepinephrine they found that on day 4 the patients were the mean positive balance on day 4 the uh, mean positive balance at 12 hours was 4.2 liters and on day 4 it was as much as 11 liters so that's how positive your patients may be that may be okay during the initial phase but now you get to the phase wherein less may be more and you may need to get rid of the excess fluid otherwise it can result in possible harm 
So after the ebb phase of resuscitation, you reach the flow phase, wherein your patient is adequately filled. Not only are they adequately filled, you may have filled them a bit too much during the flow phase. When there is an increase in the cardiac output, tissue perfusion has more or less returned to normal. And you see an X-ray like this, then you know that your patient is fluid overloaded, or they may be on the verge of getting acute respiratory distress syndrome. And that's when, probably too late, you should have done it earlier, you consider diuresis or removal of the excess fluid. So what are the problems with excessive fluid? What are the problems with loading them too much or going too far during the ebb phase? You might get interstitial and intraalveolar edema, as you can see very clearly on this X-ray. The venous pressure rises, and that reduces the perfusion pressure to the vital organs, most importantly to the kidneys, which might actually show signs of failure. Myocardial edema may occur, which would paradoxically reduce cardiac output at this very crucial phase. The intra-abdominal pressure may rise because of the retained fluid, resulting in translocation from the gut, increased gut edema, all these can adversely affect your patients. So that's the phase of the flow phase. And that's when you need to resort to measures that will help get rid of the excess fluid. There are many different ways in which you can do it. One of them is, of course, to use frusamide, the simple technique. If your patient is still not in anuric renal failure, you might try frusamide, which might get rid of the fluid, or you could try renal replacement therapy, usually continuous renal replacement therapies in this situation. So the big question is, in this time and age of evidence-based medicine, do we have any evidence to support the de-resuscitation strategy? Not many prospective trials, I'm afraid, one of the trials that's often cited is this study, a retrospective study of 400 patients by Silver Sites et al., in which they looked at de-resistive measures. And in their cohort of 400 patients, in 52.3% of patients, some kind of de-resuscitative measure was employed. And they found in this trial, in this retrospective trial, that fluid balance on day three was an independent predictor of 30-day mortality. And if they could produce a negative fluid balance by day three with either frusamide or renal replacement therapy, the mortality was indeed lower. So that is a piece of evidence that fits the jigsaw that suggests, that supports the use of a de-resuscitative strategy. We have another study called the FACI study, which uh, they were very ambitious. They were planning to recruit a large number of patients, but in the end, they ended up with a small sample size, and it ended up being just a pilot study. Here again, they tried frusamide or CRRT for fluid removal with a negative balance of one mil per kilogram per hour or more. And they found that they could significantly reduce the cumulative fluid accumulated at five days post-randomization. And they could, although they could not find any positive benefit with this small sample size of about 30 odd patients, they could detect no harm either. So this strategy effectively showed that you could employ a strategy of de-resuscitation with rosamide or continuous renal replacement therapies. It is feasible and it results in no harm either. So these are the modalities that you have in hand. The use of frusamide, if your patient is still passing urine, you could augment the urine output using frusamide, or perhaps if they are oliguric or anuric, you could use 
continuous renal replacement therapies as the modality of fluid removal among these patients. We move on to the second controversy that has been hitting the headlines of journals in the past several years. In fact, I should say in the past several decades regarding what is the problem with normal saline? Should we look at a balanced crystalloid solution instead of saline in the resuscitation of critically ill patients, particularly septic patients? Normal saline has a long history, beginning with nearly 200 years ago, back in 1831, when Thomas Latta, a Scottish physician, he used intravenous normal saline to resuscitate one of his very sick patients. This lady in her mid-30s presented with severe cholera, which was a pretty much a pandemic at that time. It had originated somewhere in India, spread through to the Middle East, the entire South, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and moved across to Europe. And invariably, it was it spread like wildfire, as you would expect in England as well. So this Scottish physician, he saw his patient. Her eyes were sunken. There was a deathly pallor on her face. And at that time, he told himself, now is the time to try out something new. And that's when he tried out intravenous saline for the first time. And lo and behold, his patient improved within a matter of a few hours. The color returned to her face. Her pulse was more easily felt. And she went on to recover. Now, what is the problem with normal cell line that Thomas Latta used way back in 1831? One of the problems we know is that it's got a sodium content of 154 millimoles per liter. The chloride content is also 154 millimoles per liter. So what does it do? It increases the chloride concentration relatively more because chloride starts from a level of 105. So 154 against 105 versus 154 against 140 for normal cell line, that results in an, a relatively disproportionately high increase in the chloride levels. And when the chloride levels rise, as you can see in this strong ion difference equation, you will get a narrower strong ion difference. And the more narrow the strong ion difference, the more acidotic your patient will be. So that is the basic concept of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis that results from excessive normal saline infusion and excessive chloride levels. And moreover, it can also cause afferent arteriolar constriction in the kidney and that reduces renal perfusion. So these mechanisms can result in possible harm from too much of saline. So that's where people started looking at alternatives, including ringer lactate and the use of plasmalite, which is a balanced crystalloid solution as well. So here again, what evidence do we have to support one versus the other? It's a centerpiece of controversy even today, in spite of several clinical trials in the last few in the last few years one of the earliest trials was a split trial which was only meant to be a feasibility trial in which they compared plasmalite 148 with normal saline in four icus in new zealand but in this one of the pioneering trials, they could not find any improvement, any difference in clinical outcomes with the use of plasma 848 as against normal saline. The requirement for renal replacement therapy as well as ICU and hospital mortality were pretty much similar in both the groups. But as I mentioned, the study was not powered for clinical endpoints. It was only a feasibility trial. And then three years down the line, 
we had the SMART trial, which was conducted at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center ICUs. And they compared plasmalite or lactated ring air solution with normal saline. And they looked at MAKE30, which is major adverse kidney events at 30 days as the primary outcome. Now, MAKE30, major adverse kidney event, includes three components. First is mortality at 30 days. Second is the requirement for renal replacement therapy. And the third is persisting renal dysfunction. So it's a combination of all three. It's a composite outcome. They found that the incidence of MAKE30 or adverse events at day 30, which includes all three of these composite events, was higher with normal saline compared to plasmalite or ring as lactate. So that was a pretty good signal that the use of excess normal saline could possibly result in harm from this fairly large size randomized control trial. Although they did not find any difference in the mortality itself, which was one of the components of the MAKE30 composite outcome, nor did they find any difference in the ventilator-free or ICU-free days. And of course, one of the problems when you use a composite outcome is that it becomes a, a combination of several outcomes, and that is perhaps less authentic than looking at a single outcome. But it helps in terms of reducing the sample size and making the trial more easy to carry out. During the same time period, the same university hospitals at Vanderbilt they conducted a similar study in the emergency department, which came up with similar findings, with an increase in the MAKE30 adverse events with normal saline use. More recently, in 2021, we had the Bay 6 trial from Brazil, which looked at plasma, plasma light 148 versus normal saline. They could not find any difference between these two, normal saline and plasma 148 in terms of renal replacement therapy or mortality. But they did find in tune with several other studies as well, that in traumatic brain injury, mortality was lower, 90-day <clears throat> mortality was lower with normal saline compared with a balanced salt solution in traumatic brain injury. So that's an important point to take home. In traumatic brain injury, specifically normal saline would be preferable due to several reasons, the least of it not being the hypoosmolar nature of balanced crystalloids. Normal saline has a higher osmolality. So that is probably one of the reasons why in TBI, if you're given the choice of fluid, it should be normal saline and not a balanced salt solution. And the latest study of all of them has been the PLUS randomized controlled trial, which is conducted in 53 ICUs in Australia and New Zealand. Here again, they compared plasma 148 with saline. However, they could not find any difference between these two different solutions in terms of hardcore clinical outcomes. However, the study was uh, had a few limitations, as in it was seized early and it did not attain the planned sample size. Non-protocol fluids were administered when the patient was outside the ICU, either in the emergency department or later on when they were transferred to the ward. And many patients had open label saline who were in fact randomized to the plasma light arm. So at the end of the day, the question is still not totally resolved, but we know for sure that the use of a balanced crystalloid, as in ring lactate or plasmalite, probably does not result in any harm when compared to normal saline, one. And of course, we know that metabolic acidosis, hyperchloremia is more common with normal saline. So under most clinical circumstances, you would prefer one of these two, ring lactate or plasmalite, Plasmalite for us is expensive. There is no special reason why we should use it. So ring lactate would come in very handy. But do remember 
in traumatic brain injury, normal saline is always the preferred fluid. The next controversy is what is a good time to do renal replacement therapy? This is another contentious issue which is bemused intensivists over the years. In fact, if you look back upon history, even during the time of the Vietnam War, back in the 1960s, when renal replacement therapy was first commenced in intensive care units, the, one of the leading critical care doctors of that era, Conger, he observed that the use of early dialysis in severely injured patients in the battlefield resulted in poor renal recovery. So that's one of the things that he noticed even in those early days, more than 60 years ago during the Vietnam War. So you should get the timing right, like with many other interventions in critically ill patients, the timing of renal replacement therapy is very important. So when do we commonly start renal replacement therapy? We do it for correction of electrolyte and metabolic abnormalities. We do it when your patient is fluid overloaded to get rid of the excess fluid as in de-resuscitation, as, as part of a de-resuscitation strategy, or just because your patient is oli oliguric or aneuric and, the, and he has fluid overload. However, you must be careful with resorting to dialysis too early because you might end up using renal replacement therapy for many patients who did not actually require it. It can cause hemodynamic instability and hemodynamic instability during the early phase of renal failure can be very detrimental. The kidneys which are on the verge of failure might just slip off the slope and they may reach the stage of irreversible renal failure. If you start a tad too early and if you cause hemodynamic instability and too much delay can also hurt. If you delay dialysis unnecessarily for a longer period of time, that obviously will have adverse outcomes as well. So it is important to get the timing just right. Five important clinical trials have looked at the timing of renal replacement therapy during in patients with acute kidney injury. The first among these was the ELINE trial published in 2016, where they randomized patients with uh, KDGO2 or KDGO3. Early was KDGO2, later was KDGO3. This is one of the one of the few studies that showed lower mortality with earlier dialysis, as in KDGO2, rather than within 12 hours of KDGO3. But then this study was complicated by the fact that they were surgical patients, did not include most of the patients are surgical. Second was the low fragility index. Fra fragility index means in this case, it is three. In this case, it means if three patients had been in the on the other side, which is late instead of early, the results would have been non-significant. And there was no difference in the 28-day and 60-day mortality. Okay, so, so there was a reduction in the 90-day mortality with no difference in the 28 and 60-day mortality, which itself is hard to explain. Or surgical patients, doubts existed as to whether the results can be extrapolated to medical patients as well. The Akiki 1 trial, in their study, early was KDGO, both groups were KDGO 3, early was immediately after randomization, and later was when any of these things occurred, high potassium more than 6, one more than 112 or severe metabolic acidosis is a pH less than 7.15. They found that 
if you delayed renal replacement therapy to later on when any of these features appeared, 49% of patients escaped dialysis completely. So that was one of the relevant findings. And they could not find any difference in important clinical outcomes. So this study suggested that if you, are, if you jump too early, you might end up dialyzing up to 49% of the patients unnecessarily. So that was the gist of that study. The ideal ICU study used rifle left criteria, stage F within 12 hours and after 48 hours as an early and late, and they couldn't find any difference in the important clinical endpoints. Backshaw et al. start AKI 2020. Early was KDGO 2 or 3 uh, within 12 hours of randomization. Later was only if any of these features appear. pH less than 7.2, bicarb less than 12, potassium more than 6, or persistent fluid overload. And they found that RRT dependence was higher at 90 days with early strategy. So in this case, KDGO 2 or 3 within 12 hours before any of these adverse biochemical parameters arose, if you dialyze them earlier, it resulted in a higher dependence on renal replacement therapy at 90 days, which again suggests that too early can be bad. Godry et al. in their Ekiki 2 trial, they tried to delay things even further. As you remember, in the previous trial, the bun criterion for di dialysis was between 112 and 140. But in this study, they delayed it until the bun rose more than 140. And they found that if you delay too much, if you delay for the bun to rise more than 140, compared to between 112 and 140, the 60 day mortality was higher. So too much delay can also be harmful. So at the end of the day, looking at the evidence that we have, needless to emphasize that timing is all important. And if you dialyze patients who do not satisfy biochemical criteria or fluid overload criteria, as in severe metabolic acidosis, potassium less than six, fluid overload, et cetera, and a bond level of more than 100, 112. If you dialyze them without these criteria being met, there must be a good reason. If you don't have a good reason to do dialysis, it might well be unnecessary or you might even end up causing harm. So just to summarize, first strategy that I mentioned is one of de-resuscitation. You fluid load your patients during the early phase of resuscitation, but in the later phase, the flow phase, you wind down, try to get rid of the fluid with renal replacement therapy if your patient has acute kidney injury or using furosemide as a diuretic. Second, you would use a balanced crystalloid solution under most circumstances compared to normal saline. That is a gist of what we find in randomized controlled trials of late, except under one situation, that is traumatic brain injury, where you would still resort to normal saline. And third, timing of renal replacement therapy is most important. Compared to yesteryears, when we resorted to dialysis early, in fact, oliguria by itself was, an was considered to be an indication to commence renal replacement therapy. But we need not jump that early. The evidence today suggests you might as well wait. And a late strategy may be equally efficacious and perhaps even be less harmful as Conger observed way back during the Vietnam War. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for that overview. I think um, you covered three important areas related to hemodynamics and fluid. You're muted. Yeah. 
Am I not audible? Sir, you're audible. Sir, thank you for bringing those three important areas. The initial one, we spoke about the optimization of the fluids in the intensive care unit and the cumulative 72 hours fluid balance as um, shown towards a trajectory of increased mortality was the first point. A choice of fluids uh, where the controversy related to the hyperchloremic fluids versus a normal chloremic fluids, uh, giving an overview. And the last one is the timing of RRT. So we have few questions uh, related to that, sir. Will you, uh, we will take those questions, sir. Yes. Questions are related to um, how do you see albumin as a uh, de-resectative fluid? Uh, yes, if you are asking about my practice, I do use albumin occasionally, not all the time, depends on the clinical circumstances, in patients whom I use diuresis with frismide, particularly when I try to dry them out, particularly if they are still sort of borderline in terms of the filling status, which you can identify using echocardiography or ultrasonography primarily. So in that situation, I might consider using albumin, not all the time, of course. And the solution that we have today most commonly is 20% albumin. If you look at the evidence, uh, in fact, the ALBIOS trial looked specifically at albumin compared to crystalloid resuscitation uh, in patients, in critically ill patients. And they actually aim for a albumin level rather than just use it as a fluid for during de-resuscitation. And overall, they did not find any difference in important clinical outcomes, including the 28-day mortality. But in a subgroup of septic patients, there was some signal towards improved survival with the use of 20% albumin, although this was a post hoc analysis. Post -hoc analysis. So, so there is no hard evidence to go by. You would need to you know, take account of the clinical situation. Some patients who are especially borderline in terms of their fluid intravascular volume status may require, may benefit with the use of albumin. But uh, as a general rule, I wouldn't suggest using albumin all the time as part of the de-resuscitation strategy. I, I think the common uh, scenario in many of our ICUs uh, where we are stuck badly is a leaky capillaries, third spacing, a very uh, boogie or edematous anasarchic patient. Uh, with some borderline hypoalbuminemia, and you have a borderline hemodynamics. So uh, only for a semide, depleting the intravascular volume further would compromise your hemodynamics in one side. The other side, giving any uh, kind of volume to it will leak into the third, third space. So this is not an uncommon scenario. And as many of us in the clinical practice individualizes these patients to use um, albumin plus diuresis. But the point is, is scientific basis, sir. And the other thing is the use of albumin as a carrier molecule for some of these furosemide to reach the distal tubules was one theory. And the theoretical aspect of that albumin adding to increase the urine output compared to um, when is only furosemide used Albumin plus furosemide versus only furosemide used. So any insights into that, sir? I remember a study, I think, uh, from way back in the 1990s, which specifically looked at furosemide-albumin combination versus furosemide alone. Of, and I can't remember the name of the author, but uh, uh, what that study found in a very small sample randomized control trial, they actually found that... It, mainly was in terms of the oxygenation and the PF ratio. And they found that the PF ratio, oxygenation, and venability from ventilation was much better with the use of the albumin frusamide strategy compared to just frusamide alone. So that was uh, one of the studies from a long time ago. But generally speaking, we do not have any kind of strong evidence to support this strategy, 
but then of course you need to understand and appreciate that you know you can't depend on a randomized controlled trial for every aspect of care and this is a particular aspect of care that hasn't really been studied to that extent and it's not easy to do a, a randomized controlled trial to specifically address this question. It will require several hundreds of patients across many ICUs across the world, not easy to carry out. So like many practices, you need to tailor the situation to the clinical requirement of your patient. As you suggested, is my patient borderline in terms of volume resuscitation? Is my patient still borderline in terms of any vasopressor requirements. Some of these patients, you might consider they are sustaining because their lungs are very wet, although they may be a little down on volume and they may be still requiring some vasopressor support. So in that situation as well, you might be tempted to use some colloid, uh, perhaps 20% albumin to fill in the intravascular space. So you need to take all these things into account before you come to a definitive answer. Although we do not have a randomized controlled trial that definitively answers this question. In any clinical guidance uh, to judge between F phase to flow phase? Question from Diaz. That again is a gray area. You need to trust your clinical judgment as to when your patient transitions from the ebb to the flow phase. But of course, there are some very obvious signs such as the vasopressor requirement coming down dramatically, improvement in the lactate levels, improvement in metabolic acidosis, urine output beginning to appear. Uh, many of these patients with uh, reasonable kidney function might actually pass, begin to pass more urine, even without uh, diuresis in this, in this particular situation. So you go by all these parameters to make a, a fine tuning, fine assessment of the situation and decide whether your patient is ready for the flow phase and de-resuscitation, as we call it. There are a few questions related to the percentage of albumin we talk about. Safe trial even uses um, the albumin in TBI with 5% and is found to be detrimental in them. Uh, so uh, we actually desk our 20% albumin. Uh, so is there any difference between the 5% albumin which is tested there and we desk 20% albumin? What will be okay. the choice of fluid when we are talking about intravascular volume replacement? Okay. Yeah, let me give you a little bit of uh, throwback in history as to why the SAFE trial used 4% albumin. Was there any special reason? Why didn't they use 5%? Why didn't they use 20%? The answer is simple because in Australia, the blood banking system, they provide hospitals free of cost, the four-person albumin free of cost. The, the hospital doesn't have to pay for it. It is just a byproduct of uh, uh, fractionation of transfusion of, uh, of blood product, and they get it for free. So that's the reason why they use four-person very commonly, or they used to at that time. And then, of course, the questions started to be asked after the Cochrane meta-analysis of the late 1990s, which questioned the use of albumin and, and came up with the finding that albumin increases mortality in all kinds of critically ill patients, including septic patients, burns patients, ARDS, and so on. So the Australians wanted to prove that this is not true. And they wanted to emphasize the fact that their strategy of resuscitation with 4% albumin, which they used, specifically 4%, was safe. And that was the background to the conduct of the safe trial, which compared 4% albumin, which they, they were using anyway, with normal cell line. And they found that there was no difference in outcomes. That was all they were trying to prove. They were all, what they were trying to prove was that it was a non-inferiority trial. So that's how 4% albumin came to be used. In India, we don't get 4%, we get only 5%, as is the case in, as far as I know, all other parts of the world except Australia. 20% we get commonly as well. So does it really matter whether you use 5% or 20%? No comparative studies are available to tell you the answer, but you would assume that it really may not matter. The strength or the concentration of the albumin that you use may not really matter. You need to give 
approximately EQ equivalent volumes in terms of the fluid that you use in, in terms of the volume. 100% of albumin, let us say, maybe roughly equal to 300 or 400 mils of 4% of 5% albumin in terms of the volume. So, so there is no kind of absolute choice in terms of the concentration of albumin that we use. Again, one of these studies on specifically for patients with spontaneous bacterial tetanitis, in whom you, you do acidic fluid drainage, that study which showed re reduced mortality with albumin, 20, they used 20% albumin in that particular trial. So that is one of the few bits of evidence that supports the use of 20% of albumin in this situation, cirrhosis with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Otherwise, uh, the Albio study used 20%. Many other trials as well, uh, most of the most observational have used 20%. So I would suggest that you could use five or 20%, nothing really much to choose between these two concentrations. There are questions related to, can we use albumin in enhancing ultrafiltration during RRT? Uh, the reason they're talking about, we see some hemodynamic fluctuation, um, intradialysis, uh, when the patient is under the dialysis, when so using albumin to maintain the blood pressure and to improve the ultrafiltration, can that be a way to? When you're using continuous renal replacement therapy, the ultrafiltration no, is think, in... Yeah, I think uh, he, he was trying to point out, can we improve the ultrafiltration? Ultrafiltration, you can set down the machine. Uh, so that wouldn't be a problem regardless of the fluid that um, you may most use. Most of the times, ultrafiltration is a concern when there are hemodynamics are not um, stabilized. Okay. So, so if you are removing fluid, if you plan to remove fluid, and if you feel that your patient needs intravascular repletion of fluid, or perhaps you could use albumin rather than use a crystalloid solution, particularly if you feel there is a preponderance towards fluid accumulation in the lung. Your patient is hypoxic, high, uh, requiring higher FiO2s, low PF ratios. In that situation, you can draw out fluid with renal replacement therapy, and you can replace it with albumin. That, of course, shouldn't be a concern in that situation. No, I wouldn't think so. What will be the primary fluid of choice for septic patient? to start with and later on the maintenance phase? I would still suggest that uh, you go by a balanced crystalloid solution. In our circumstances, Ringer lactate is as good as any other balanced crystalloid. Plasmalite is the other option, but uh, then, as I mentioned, what is a special advantage in using plasmalite? There is none that you can find if you search through literature. So Ringer's lactate is as good as any other balanced crystalloid. And you would certainly start with Ringer lactate. It's the most appropriate to do so. And uh, towards the later phase, particularly during the flow phase, particularly during the resuscitation phase, as I discussed, you might consider if at all your patient needs replenishment of fluid, you might consider albumin in that particular situation. During the early phase, as I mentioned, the SAFE trial, they did use 4% albumin and showed it to be safe, as safe as normal saline. But that doesn't mean that you use 4% instead of normal saline, because we don't get 4% albumin free by any means. So, so in our situation, I think for all we know from the evidence available that we have today, Ringer's lactate is as good as any other fluid during the cessation phase. A, a criteria for after this controversial trials of um, when to initiate an RRT early, late. What will be your personal criteria to initiate an RRT in oliguric settings and also in a fluid overload setting? Uh, oliguria by itself, as I mentioned, is not really a you know, strong indication to commence dialysis. The other criteria, as I mentioned, are fairly standardized. First of all is fluid overload, which you can assess using the PF ratio, lung ultrasonography, radiography. Uh, 
any of these. And if your patient is fluid overloaded and the, and if the diuretic furosemide particularly that you use doesn't seem to help, that's a strong indication to commence renal replacement therapy. Then of course you go by the metabolic parameters, potassium level, the degree of metabolic acidosis, bicarbonate levels, and the burn level, of course. Burn is uh, the generally accepted burn level is around 100 milligrams per deciliter. But of course, it's not a single criterion that you go by. You go by the a, a combination of all these situations. But in many, many ICU patients, particularly septic patients in whom you resort to a lot of fluid resuscitation during the early phase. Fluid overload in itself would be a strong early indicator to commence renal replacement therapy. And in that situation, the use of continuous renal replacement therapies would be preferable in that the fluid removal is in your control hour by hour and through the day as against intermittent dialysis wherein you confine your dialysis to a set period of time and you end up removing a lot more fluid on an hourly basis than continuous therapies. So continuous therapies, slow removal of fluid, begin with 50 to 100 mils removal per hour and then slowly step it up as your patient tolerates should be the way to go. There are questions related to any relation between fluids being given and change in blood pH. And that, of course, pertains to the use of normal saline. If you use excessive normal saline, well, this wouldn't matter if you're infusing just one or two liters of normal saline. But if you keep on infusing bag after bag, liter after liter of normal saline, sooner or later, the chloride levels will rise because the chloride content is 154 in normal saline, as against a plasma chloride of 105. And when the chloride levels rise, the strong ion difference will narrow down. And that will biochemically cause a metabolic acidosis. And that's how acidosis uh, happens in hyperchloremia. But the big question as to whether by itself hyperchloremia in this situation is harmful or not, we can only assume that metabolic acidosis by itself is not a good thing, but does it actually lead to impaired clinical outcomes? Of course, we don't have any kind of robust evidence to go by, but I would suggest that we rely on physiology and, uh, and not use too much normal saline because it can result in acidosis, low pH, hyper, hyperchloremia related acidosis, when you have a good alternative as in ringers lactate, except of course, conditions like traumatic pain injury, where you would specifically want a slightly fluid of slightly higher osmolality. And that would entail the use of normal saline as against a balanced crystalloid. So there are some absolute um, indications which we used to believe for albumin, including spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, uh, leading, a, leading to HRS in early part, and decompensated liver disease with HRS in early part, then a large volume parasynthesis. But off late, uh, the, the literature evidence of uh, if the patient is already established AKI in needing into oligonuric needing dialysis, the albumin has shown to be detrimental in worsening pulmonary uh, complexities or a pulmonary failure. So um, uh, that's where you're saying if the AKI is in a reversible stage where your HRS can be reverted back, your albumin have a role to play. But if it is established AKI with oliguria or anaerobic state requiring a further renal replacement therapy, in those situations, albumin was detrimental in many of those situations. What is your take on that? Is, uh, is that got to do with breakdown of the capillary barrier, which happens in sepsis throughout, including the lung? And that can, because the glycocalicial layer breakdown and accumulation of uh, albumin in the interstitium can happen. Leakage of albumin also can happen. Is that the reason why? Uh, 
Yeah, the other question are related to the cardiac failures. So we do see the, uh, the all these third spaces, including pleural uh, effusion happen, and we see many of them are hypoalbuminic. And um, it's not uncommon that many clinicians do recommend or do use albumin to build those albumin to uh, de-resuscitate them or to drop this um, um, pleural effusion. So any uh, light on it? I I don't think there is uh, evidence or experience to support a, a uniform strategy of albumin use specifically in these situations. Uh, you would consider using it just as you would consider in any other fa any uh, any other situation where you need to do res resuscitation, not particularly to not particularly because of ascites or pleural effusion. Although, as I mentioned, in, as you also mentioned, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, acidic fluid drainage is considered to be still a good indication for albumin use. But as a general rule, I don't think you should resort to the practice of using albumin in patients with pleural effusions, particularly. And uh, that would entail the use of a whole lot of albumin, particularly clinicians tend to use or overuse albumin to correct the serum albumin level. That yes. also is an exercise in futility because the levels will stay high only for a few hours time, at the most a day or so. And as long as the catabolic process goes on, the albumin levels will remain low. Now that would mean that you need to transfuse, infuse albumin several times a day for several days, which is not really going to make any difference in the overall clinical outcomes, I feel. Sure. At least experience suggests that it may not. So I, I am not sure if that strategy is uh, indicated. Although clinicians tend to resort to it quite often. The ARRT timing has been a controversy, sir. As you said, the conventional uh, indication remained the same throughout the um, maybe the medical literature scheme metabolic acidosis, volume overload, hyperkalemia, or uremic symptoms. But the point which was not the, the initial part when none of these absolute indications were not there to just based on your renal polygamia or your uremia or creatinine was never an indication to dialyze. So, but there was now a discussion of AKRRT group saying ki, uh, the trajectory of the demand and resolve as a clinician in the bedside, you see whether what is happening to your renal function and the disease with which the kidney got affected. If you are looking at a patient whose renal functions are worsening with the disease process, which is worsening, probably it is a time uh, not to wait for further expecting a renal recovery. Uh, some kind of those uh, concepts which are still subjective, but any take on that, the demand and the reserve strategy. I completely agree with that, particularly as you very rightly pointed out, the progress or the trajectory of the illness is very crucial. If your patient seems to be on the on the down downhill slope and and it looks like the requirement for inner placement is imminent. And particularly in a situation where it takes time to organize, renal replacement therapy, depending on the type of ICU that you work in. If you need to speak to your uh, nephrologist or if you need to get dialysis technicians, that might entail some delay. And if that is the case, it is probably better to plan early, especially if you know that your patient is going downhill and sooner or later, it will be inevitable. In that situation, and particularly if the demand is high, as you mentioned, you might consider earlier. And that's when you need to tailor your treatment to the situation that you find yourself in. So um, I think there were questions related to the role of albumin in capillary leak. More precisely, sir, um, we see a dengue capillary leak as a very common a syndrome or a scenarios in our part of the world. So um, we do understand there was no much studies on albumin being as a colloid or as a resuscitation fluid we used in those second week where your capillaries starts leaking. 
So you have a hemodynamic instability and the moment you give some crystalloids, they leak into the capillaries. And when I actually Googled through the WHO literatures and others up to date, they talked about dextran or some other colloids. And none of the times albumin was mentioned anywhere as a part of it. So I don't know whether it is a glycocalicial disruption, worry about the albumin getting leaked and that can be counterproductive by the um, the further worsening of the capillary leak. Uh, but there were maybe pockets of information where there is a balanced use of colloids in the form of either a dextran or albumin, even in the guidelines of WHO's flow chart I have seen. So what is your take on that, sir? Capillary leaks in dengue. As a general rule, again, you wouldn't resort to the use of uh, albumin in any strength in dengue. Of course, it's a it's an open field for research. The truth is that we don't have any kind of research into this area. Uh, in fact, there is some evidence to suggest that the use of FFP might actually be beneficial uh, in dengue. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so, so a natural colloid kind of phenomenon. Yeah, and plus Adam TS thirteen platelet aggregation, all those things might the underlying problem in dengue might be alleviated by the use of FFP as well. But this is something that needs to be studied. I don't yeah. think we have any kind of information available at this point to support general use. Of course, in specific situations, you might still consider. Thank you, sir. I think most of the questions uh, you give your expert opinion and you are sharing your experience and wisdom in this. As we say, uh, most of them are controversies. So those controversies remain for ever. And there's uh, maybe literature uh, can keep on uh, changing with the more evidences coming up. So thank you very much for being a part of this program and enlightening all of us and sharing your knowledge. And we thank all the participants to be a part of it and uh, participated very actively. There are many questions right now also. So we hope, sir, to come back with the, all other dip, uh, the um, other system controversies also with you in the future and uh, making this uh, discussion more extensive in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, for... Venkat. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I'll see you next time. Thank Bye you, for sir. now. I conclude the session. Thank you all.